folks, and welcome or welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima, I'm again, and this podcast was brought to you, among others, by Emil Gorgis, a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian. He's been living here in Japan for the past two decades, eight years of which he's been actively buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in the city, on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So his company has a dedicated loan officer in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts panel sessions. So you're probably already aware that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or if you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, drop him a line on emil.gorgis, that's E-M-I-L dot G O R G double E S Emil dot Gorgies at Tokyo Realty dot JP. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right, so for today's episode, here with the JREP crew again, and this time we talk to Emil, who's back from a Web3 conference in the US, and we have a chat about all things blockchain, from purchasing properties with cryptocurrency, physical versus digital ledgers, and physical versus digital real estate, property ownership and ownership transfers, title deeds, and how they can be secured, and other aspects of our brave new technological world wonders. And from there, we segue into a conversation of renovation versus rebuilds. We take a walk through a mostly dilapidated traditional Japanese home. You might want to tune in via our YouTube channel if you're listening uh, to this on the podcast, at least for that part. How do pre-purchase architectural and structural inspections work? And much, much more. So a host of really interesting topics. Some of those truly out there this time. Fantastic session lined up for you. Enjoy, and I'll see you again on the other side. All right, Japan Real Estate Experts panel, and this time with Emil. We've missed you, mate. Hey, I have. I've missed you guys as well. It's good to be back. It is yeah. very good to be back. So um, maybe we start the round of intros from you this time, because people haven't heard your voice for a while. They don't know who you are. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. My name is Emil. I'm a real estate agent here in Tokyo, and I help uh, foreign locals, long foreign long-term residents, purchase their personal family home in Tokyo and um, we also help with the full mortgage broking and more like finance coordination and um, we have loan offices um, at the major banks so we can handle all your financing needs as well any questions shoot me an email my email is generally in the description of every one of Bid Ziv's videos because uh, I managed to get the sponsorship spot <laughs> for his podcast and videos um, yeah so hit me up any questions you have about financing um, house hunting process uh you know, you want to buy a house, let me know, and I'm happy to help. Thank you. And over to Blanca. Oh, hi, guys. My name is Blanca, uh, and I am the co-founder and the marketing director of Arc Reform. We are the bilingual uh, real, uh, reform company that is based in Tokyo and in Chiba. So we help people renovate their houses, their homes, their commercial properties, stores, restaurants, bars, anything, any property you have and you need, we are here to help you to doll it up, make it beautiful. And we do that uh, in English and in Japanese. So any foreigner that is afraid that they would not understand the process, that they cannot read uh, the quotations, they cannot discuss with their contractors properly, we are here for you because everything can be handled in English. Uh, and, you know, all paperwork can be handled in English as well. So we are here for you. So shoot me a message if you have any questions or if you want to renovate or even destroy anything. I've got uh, something to share with you. Too. I'll share with all of you, but it will be specifically for you, Blanca. I'd like to get your, um, your professional view on a house that we visited last weekend. But before that, Tracy. 
Hi everyone. I'm also a proud sponsor of this podcast. So um, with my company, Tokyo Family Stays. So Tokyo Family Stays is a short-term rental business. Um, I look after it, mostly inbounds. So when you're coming to Japan and you're looking for a house, you can come stay in one of my houses. Um, or if you're coming for a trip um, or you're coming into Tokyo, that's, that's what I, that's, what I started doing 10 years ago. Um, but what I also do is I manage other people's properties. So if you have a property and uh, you want to want to use it part-time and you want to rent it out part-time, I can manage that for you. Or if you just want to learn how to do it, I'm also a coach and a mentor for profitability and hospitality. So that's what I do. I do all things short-term rental. So that's me. And I am Ziv Nakajima again. I'm also in business here in Japan for about 10 years, and I am co-founder and partner of Nippon Tradings International, MTI, which is a company that helps uh, people purchase, manage, and or sell properties uh, anywhere in Japan, not necessarily um, owner occupied properties like Emil does and not and we don't really deal in short term management which is what Tracy does and we um, hire people to do renovations and rebuilds and reforms which is what Blanca does um, and now also co-founder and partner of another new company called Nippon Bridge which helps people do the same thing but not with property but investing in businesses in Japan and also to help them relocate to Japan get a business management visa if they do own and run a business here um, and that's me so Welcome uh, aboard everyone who's joining us for the first time. And uh, well, Blanca, before I dive into what I wanted to show you, um, Emil, just, you just came back from the US. What's um, feet on the ground view? What's the different, the major differences in um, life on the street between here and uh, what we should say that we're recording this on 1st June, 2022. What uh, major noticeable differences have you spotted? Well, Japan is different to everywhere else. Um, yeah, that's so always the case. Isn't it? It was, yeah, <laughs> I was in I was in Minneapolis, um, which I was just you know it's a small smallish city, but buildings are nice and big. Felt like quite you know a very beautiful small city. Um, big open roads, lots of breweries. I went there with a bunch of Australians, so lots of brewery hopping. Um, very, very, like, again, just very quiet. Like, when we were in the Uber driving around, I just, like, it was Wednesday afternoon or Thursday afternoon, like, 2 p.m. I said, where is everyone? Well, everyone's working at home. But <laughs> apart from a bunch of Aussies walking, like, downtown, walking around the city, there was, like, no one there. It felt like a ghost town. Um, and then it was like, oh, everyone worked from home since pandemic. They everyone just worked from home. And now uh, it's not really, it's, also it's, not, it's not mandatory anymore, is it? They're just doing it because they got used to it, right? I I guess so. I guess so. But lots of offices, they just, they felt empty. And there's no one like just at lunchtime. There's, people aren't walking. Like I'm from Melbourne. So Melbourne City, people are walking to cafes lunchtime. Everyone's out of the offices, right? Not, nothing like that at all. Um, there just wasn't anyone around. Even not many cars. There's no traffic at all throughout the whole, the whole time. Um, and, and also what's strange is no one wears masks. So... Now they're just starting starting in, in Tokyo to, I think, loosen up the recommendation that if you're outdoors and over two meters away, you don't need to wear a mask. There, yeah, just no one wears a mask anywhere. I, I barely saw anyone in the event that we attended, which has a few, a few thousand. So pretty much the whole city, anywhere we see, I'd say foreigners. <laughs> That's what it felt like. Um, but anyway, we see people in the city, they're generally there for our event, um, but for the conference we were attending. Um, yeah, but there's just no masks. And even in the stadium we were at with like 5,000 people, just 10 people wearing a mask. Um, so that, that, that vibe is quite different. But I haven't been out of the country for two and a half years. So maybe it's just me. Everything feels different now, right? It does. It does. And how was, um, how was um, transit? I mean, through the airport, on the airplane, how, how's flying? I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. I had like a tw 26 hours there, like a, a cancel and like crazy delay there oh. and then like a, a cancel and like a, a overnight you know layer was maybe like four hours would end up being like 20 like 30 hours i think on the way back so yeah it, it just it wasn't not, not that it was pleasant at all in terms of the 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 flights what um was the any event? what was the conference you went to 
I was, it was like a Web3 conference. So no, nothing like nothing really real estate related, but I am kind of very interested in, in real estate in the metaverse. So mm-hmm. um, that, that's just sort of an interest because I'm inherently interested in real estate. Now with metaverse and Web3 and digital land ownership in that yeah. sort of space, um, that's, that's something that I'm a little bit curious about. So although that wasn't a main theme of it, uh, just moving forward Web3 space, that's something that I think is uh, is interesting only because of my real world interest and passion for real estate. So what's uh, that's like a NFT real estate? Is that what it is? Uh, well, well, blockchain sort of allows you to have ownership, like it proves ownership of digital assets, right? Of you know NFTs are thought of more often as, as JPEGs, right? But yeah, NFT like non fungible token um, allows you to say that you you can have a title and it can't be duplicated. Right, no one can just copy it. It's your certificate of authenticity and of ownership. So now, in a metaverse space, you can actually even own a piece of land. You can own anything, be it an image, just a piece of art, digital art. That I think what NFTs are and traditionally, like currently, being known for is just a JPEG saving an image. Whereas, but you can have sort of digital assets as well. Um, and so, in the, there are different metaverse platforms. Um, so like, you know, Facebook has the meta is, is, is one such thing, but there's, I think, um, uh, um, uh, sandbox is one, uh, actually, uh, my mind's going blank right now. Um, how, you monet- how would you monetize a piece of land like that? Like, you know, what would be the point other than the bragging rights? I'm always looking. Oh, well, for so, pro- I'm always looking for the profit, right? Yeah, I'm I think, yeah, okay. the business model. Oh yeah, so 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 let's okay. So if you think of the metaverse as imagine you can enter like a 3D space and you can enter it and in- interact within space. It's it's a fixed world. It's a world of a certain size, a fixed size. And there are some brands opening. There are certain areas within that world, that virtual world, that metaverse, particular metaverse, that you can go and participate in events in. Right. So in the same way that there's like Tokyo City, right? To- or Tokyo Prefecture, like Tokyo, there's different areas within Tokyo. Some are hotter than others. And you know, you want to go to Ginza, there are certain brands that are there, there are certain events that are being held there. Right. So if you own a piece of land there, you can rent it out to yeah. someone. Or if it's what you know, if if some big brands start also buying up in that area so they can have a virtual um, showroom in that space and you own space in this by that hot area that's it's, it's quite similar to real world um dynamics uh is how i can see it happening um and because of you know in web3 it's blockchain manages the ownership the digital rights digital certificates you have it and the developer cannot take it away from you and they cannot transfer it from you you have the rights and only you can sell it or control it. Um, that's the change in Web3 that's different to something like Facebook, a platform like Facebook, where should Facebook at any stage want to remove my page, they can remove the page, right? They can delete it. They can block it. Yeah. Whereas in Web3, that's that's not the case. Um, and that's what ownership, talk, when we talk about Web3 ownership. But Blanket, it sounds like you know, just you nodding your head when, I, when we mention it. You're like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel that you're already kind of intrigued and maybe playing in this space it's part of my husband's business one of his businesses because he's a blockchain investor so he does he does a lot of business uh on blockchain so that's um and nft is also he wrote a book on nft last year and there we go so i'm kind of like yeah i'm familiar with you saying i've been hearing um a lot because when my husband has all the all different uh, kind of Zoom conferences and and things like that. So I always I'm, I'm usually in the room. So it's you know a lot of yeah. lots of things I've heard over the years. Yeah. It's fascinating stuff. I um I mean not not I'm not too familiar with digital assets in the real estate realm specifically, but I can definitely see how that would work. I mean, if you look at it today, if you want to advertise, well, you can basically advertise anywhere on the web practically for free but if you want to advertise in a popular facebook group somebody owns it it's going to cost you money right so 
that kind of thing. Yeah. And also, if you look at, I mean, I was into video games back, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago or what, and there was already people with digital assets that other people wanted who were selling it for real cash. And the same thing is happening today as well. I mean, my son pays large parts of his allowance to get a fancy skin in Fortnite, like a suit for his character to wear, right? So um, they're, no. they're very, very real. Yeah. yeah. And if you think about it, I mean, if you have a Rolex on your hand, it's not like you can't tell the time anywhere else, right? But you still, you have a Rolex on your hand. People see that and it gives you, I guess, social status or value or what have you not, even though it's practically, it's not, not very much a practical thing these days, but it's still very much got its value. Well, a good, a good example that they refer to often is in terms of what a digital, like what's the clouds, like, you know, a Rolex is a Rolex and we're used to these physical objects or, you know, drive BMW or Mercedes or Ferrari, so, you know, exotic, that has a certain status. Well, if you look at digital, what has a digital status? Just think the check mark verified on Twitter. Yeah. That's nothing really. It's just a verification, but oh, hold on, you're verified? Yeah. That means something. Yeah. Right. That or has a gold a LinkedIn thing. badge, like if you're a paid member of LinkedIn, for example. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Things like that. So so similarly, like in now digital assets, they allow certain bragging rights or clout or authenticity, similar to these these um you know, other digital kind of verifications. Uh, so yeah, so there is, you know, and look, if, if people uh, like my interest in it is just I see that the future is going to be headed in. Like, you know, in the same way internet was a thing. And if you had gotten, you know, early on in the internet game, you'd be generally successful if you've put your attention there. And I feel Web3 as well is going to be uh, something important in our lives in the future. So I'm just trying to get into it early so I can, you know, um, just make the most of it moving forward. Whether or not right now I'm the current state of NFTs, the current state of blockchain, current, current metaverses, who are, are going the to be players? Popular, who are going are to they going to be in 10 years' yeah, time? Like, yeah. yeah, who knows, right? Like, yeah, we had a whole bunch of shakeouts in, in the early web days. Early web three, I think, is also similar. So it's not saying, oh, this is this is it. This is what you have to do. No, but the underlying technology and platform, and uh, I think, is going to be big moving forward. So I'm just interested to learn about it and, and to know. And blockchain it. and crypto are, I mean, similar to NFTs, I suppose. It's um, <clears throat> where the eyes are and where people go and what people find valuable is what's going to be valuable. I mean, just yesterday, I, I somebody asked me to introduce him to, a, um, he's doing projects in uh, Dubai, right? So he's, um, he's connected with developers and companies set up offices and real estate and he asked me to introduce him to a local Japanese gentleman who does um, real estate investment seminars, um, advertising various locations around the world to various Japanese investors. And this is something I've never heard from the guy before because usually he's, oh, Canadian? Yeah, sure, I want to get in touch with a Canadian, with the USA, Philippines, that's interesting. And this time, for the first time, when I said, do you, do you want to be put in touch with somebody who's doing projects in Dubai? He said, well, only if they accept crypto. Like suddenly, suddenly it's a thing, right? Like nobody, yeah. nobody's interested anymore if you're not into that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Indeed, indeed. Interesting. But, um, yeah, like I said, it, and it, yeah, it's, I think it's not relevant to real estate right now um, in our space, especially in Japan. My thoughts, like a lot of, there are a lot of comments. So my final discussion on sort of blockchain and real estate, um, there are two, I see sort of two aspects with, with real estate um, moving forward. One is digital real estate in Web3 metaverse space, which I just talked about. The other one is blockchain technology for existing real estate contracts. So traditional real estate titles and contracts, how the blockchain can make that more efficient. And the, you, you jump online and you hear lots of, you can read lots of articles about how blockchain is gonna change how sales and transactions are done. I feel in the US, yes, because there are things like title insurance is necessary because you can sell a property and it still has a lien on it by a third party, which you're not aware of. That stuff is not possible in Japan. In Japan, essentially the public ledger, like the land title that is held at City Hall is the equivalent of a blockchain. The, the title when you go to City Hall says every owner who's ever owned it and every, more, every bank or every finance institution that's ever had a lien on it and how much that lien was for and what the interest rate was for. Um, so, and any time that changes, if, 
if you sell a house, you need your bank's approval. Like in Japan, you need your bank's approval to sell it. And they will get their lawyer to remove the lien on the title. As and part of the you, settlement. That's yeah, right. As part of, part of the settlement. And you as a seller also remove your lien. And the new um, bank will have their scrivener. And the client, the new buyer will have their scrivener as well. Um, issue the re, like update the title with the new owner and the new mortgage, like the, the bank, which has the, which holds the mortgage. Oh. You know, if this was all on blockchain, then we avoid all the paperwork at City Hall. Yep. Uh, so but in, in Japan, having real estate on blockchain makes a lot of sense. You know. Oh, oh yes, but but the thing is, so it's very re regulatory, but also it's not blockchain is not solving a problem. It's just digitizing. Yes. A, a, a paper it, process, um, whereas. Yeah, but also because it's so regulatory, um, and also the current system is not broken, it will just it just makes it more efficient. It's just trans converting it from one from the current you know paper and, and city hall managed format to a blockchain managed format. But the actual, uh, but the, there are no significant enhancements. Whereas in the U.S., the land title is not managed clearly. Who owns a title? The title itself doesn't say. Who has a lien on it? Not just in the so, US. There's a lot of countries in that situation. Uh, yeah, a lot of countries. Yeah. So there's it can significantly in blockchain technology. I think can significantly improve the existing system, right? Because there are some downfalls where there are gaps in the existing system where someone not listed on the title can have a lien on it, and a buyer who buys it may not be aware of that. That's not mm. possible with the Japanese system. So. I, and also because of regulatory structure, it's going to be, I feel this Japan's going to be slow to adopt it. But at the end of the day, there's, apart from it being a digital version, it's a digital version of what is currently already there. Whereas in other countries, and the US is the example I use, there is enhancement. It's not just a digital version of the current system. It's fixing a lot of broken areas, right? Mm. There'll be no need for title insurance anymore in the US, right? Um, whereas, yeah, that's not an issue, I think, in, in Japan. Um, so I think it's going to be a long time um, before it, Japan is good. You hit it on the head when you said uh, in Japan it's not broken, so they would not fix it. <laughs> well, I mean, for, um, you know, regardless of broken or not, uh, for Japan to adopt any any new trend or technology. I mean, if it's a, if it's a fashion or food trend, yes, but anything yeah. else. Yes. Mm. But, uh, you know, you so you would still have to do the trip to the city hall, but uh, yeah, it's good. You know, I think blockchain. Uh, you know, it is it is a future because there's so many ways it can enhance our life and make it easier and more, uh, you know, more transparent. I know that living in Japan, we don't really have that problem. Uh, even the corruption and uh, you know, it's not that big here. As you say, the scams in terms of properties are not that big but you know life goes beyond japan and and so i think yeah, yeah it's not going to be it's not going to be that that fast adopting anything i else. hope so and, and i agree i think it's um it's definitely where we're going i'm just wondering how the you know major governments are going to take to the fact that they don't get a piece of the pie anymore that'll be interesting to see uh oh. yeah that's why you will see that um uh, it always comes it always comes with the government of a country mm. Because if the cover, if the government has no, they if they know that they can get a lot of bribes and a lot of side money out of something, it's when they will not adopt it. Only if they want to do, if it's like a new government when they want to make something better for the country, and they want a control over how it's done, then they will adopt the blockchain technology for that particular industry. But it all comes and goes with the government, honestly, because at the end of the day, they have the biggest portion of the pie when it comes to unregistered money and, and everything. So well, that's oh, but, interesting. Yeah, I think that, that's a different topic to like that is blockchain technology, I think, in, 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 in lots of aspects of government. But in terms of title registration and property ownership registration, um, I, I, I just can't see that sort of changing and it's not about the company like 
corruption or anything like that. It just it's literally just a digital version of the paper version that currently exists. Yeah, uh, and and you're still going to need, I think, lawyers or professionals to execute that Bitcoin contract, that, that the blockchain contract. Um, it's it's not something that individuals can do. Like, and even now, technically, so right now, you don't need a scrivener to do the title change. You don't. You can do it on your own. Um, uh, the word, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if you get, if you want to get financing, right, the bank won't allow you to do it on your own because the bank is saying, "Hold on a second, we we want to make sure it's done properly. We want to pay a professional to do it, and you have to pay a professional to do it as well, mm -hmm. right?" Um, and so I feel even if you're going to do blockchain implement blockchain technology for that same title management, the bank is still going to want a professional to do that blockchain execution that 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 contract or that action right it's yeah it still needs to be provided by i think so if anything if they do start doing that the current scriveners and they um that do that work are going to also provide the service to do the same work for the the blockchain transaction mm. um i yeah i like and and that's the banks and the third parties and even myself like if I have a client that says, I'll do it myself. No, no, no. I don't want you locking anything up. I don't want you, like, if, if we're selling a house, I'm, our client is going to want to make sure it's done professionally. Yeah. And same with buying. It's like, no, it has to be done professionally and you pay for that service. We so, even tell people who say, um, like, we, we sometimes get contacted by people who say, um, you know, my, my father-in-law has said that, you know, we can take the house or we, you know, we just need to pay them such and such amount. It's a really good deal. And, can we do it ourselves and save on the legal and registration fees? And we always say, I mean, yes, technically you can. And, you know, technically maybe you don't even need to do a real, you know, to involve a real estate agent in that, but definitely don't do it without a scrivener. Like don't, don't I mean, the amount of, the amount of hassle that'll create down the track, if anything was even slightly misrepresented along the way, um, you can be, you can end up in very bad shape. Mm. Yeah, precisely. Um, with, with title registration, I think title transfer is okay. But yeah, if, if the bank is going to do the financing, they won't accept you doing a transfer without yeah. the, the proper professionals doing the paperwork, the contract of sale, and the the actual um, uh, title transfer registration. Mm. So we won't accept an individual doing it. We interrupt this broadcast, I always wanted to say this, we interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, or if you just need summer quiet to hide away from the world. So they offer a variety of options for families, for corporate relocations, or simply if you're transitioning between homes in Tokyo. Now the properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They've got fast, unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in, a fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but long term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, you definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profits or a holiday home that you want rented out when not in use via short-term stays, drop them a line today see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com, well worth your visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, 
Emil is your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at emil.gorgies, G-O-R-G-E-E-S at tokyorealty.jp. Uh, there were two things actually I want to bring up. So Ziv, you referred someone to me. Um, just I had, a, I had a chat with him yesterday, uh, someone in Kobe. Yep. Um, who was interested in purchasing a home in, again, and it was like a 30-year-old home and he wanted to renovate it. And I think the renovation was about 7 million yen. So there's two things I discussed with him. The main one was about home loan interest rates. Should you get variable or fixed interest, right? And that's something sort of I want to touch on. But the other one, which I think I want to sort of ask Blanca about is, he wants to spend about 7 million yen to renovate a 30-year-old home. Mm-hmm. <coughs> so about 7 million, so 70,000 US roughly. What are your thoughts on spending that much on renovating an old home, like a 30-year-old home that I think even if you put that much money into it, it's still a 30-year-old home. It's generally my thought thinking is, you're not it, going to be able to resell it in 10 years time. It's like the value is gone completely. It's a lot of, you know what? It's a lot of aspects you have to look at when you are renovating a house, when a, whether you want to, you know, first of all, where it is, uh, what is the, like, what's the construction actually of the house? Because sometimes it's easier to just bring it down and build a new one but it does not always work. Will you get a permit to rebuild or do you have to fix just the inside because you cannot, you cannot rebuild if you took it down. If you could rebuild, can you rebuild in the same size, same height? Uh, you know, so there's a lot of things that go when you are looking, but to be honest, $70,000 is not a big deal. Uh, it's not a lot of money spent on a renovation if you are renovating a whole house. Uh, that's basically my bathroom. That's almost that's almost as much as we spend on our bathroom. So I don't think it depends what you are actually renovating and what materials you are putting in. It depends also how if you are planning to live in that house, if it's like your house, like your, where you are planning to retire then go ahead, do it, do a really nice proper renovation because that's your house where you're going to spend your next 20, 30 years. If you are renovating a house and you are already planning on selling it, that's a completely different issue. So I think people, when they want to do a total reform of a property, uh, when they buy a, like a rundown property and want to renovate it, they are renovating with uh, an aspect in mind. We are discussing right now with the client that is buying a rundown property and wants to renovate it uh, because he wants to partially live there and partially have it as a studio. So people have different uh, different uses for their properties, different you know, different reasons, different whys. So, where would you, Blanca? Where would you draw the line? Like, what are the things that you look at before you tell somebody, look, this is maybe not worth renovating i mean the i don't know the the base or the walls or the pillars are you know are not in good shape anymore you might as well just tear it down and when do you say okay renovation might make sense yeah if it's not safe if you are looking that the walls are already bad uh you know if you have to change the whole roof you have to reinforce all the walls uh and also, you know, if you can rebuild and if it's like the whole old Japanese houses where basically there's almost no rumble because there's no insulation, there is nothing, then it makes sense to tear it down and build a new one. But if, it's, if, if the house has a very solid uh, structure, like our house is concrete, yeah? So for me, it makes sense to actually just renovate the house on the inside because the house is very solid and can withstand a lot of things. But so it really depends on the structure of the house. And then you should check, you know, if it has, um, if it has mold, especially the old Japanese houses, they have that space under the house. Mm -hmm. So if that space, um, if it's moldy, if it's bad, a lot of holes, you might want to, you know, think of taking it away. Uh, if the pillars are not strong and they also are already 
breaking down. If it's a two, two three story house, you have to check what is actually, um, you know, if the, if the walls and if the floorings, if everything is stable, because if you're starting to have a holes in that and you have to reinforce everything, then you are looking, you are better off building a new house than reinforcing. We even built it, one of the houses that we've built, we, we started with, the, with that project as a renovation. And then as we started, we realized, hold on a second, this is not gonna work. We cannot, because we wanted to add a floor, we realized we cannot do it. The current structure of the building would not handle that. We had to take the house down and start from the scratch. So it really, you know, as you are building, Sometimes you even realize that, as we realized that, like luckily within the first two weeks of the project. But, um, you know, you have to look at that and then call if it's three, like two, three story building, call an expert to look at the stability of the house. And, structural and inspection, right? Tra- yes, call the inspector. I think those are the, the steps. <coughs> call, you know, uh, check if the inside even works with you. But but first thing for me would be, uh, can I rebuild? Can I rebuild the same size? Or can I even, you know, go bigger than it is? What are the what are the requirements of the city? Because that that is also very important. And assuming that you, let, let's say you do have the option to rebuild, is there, like Emil was saying, a certain age where you say, look, maybe just not work? For me, it's not an age, it's the condition. The houses okay. are old and are in a great condition and they are wonderful. And you would not want to take it down. And there are houses that were already, that are run down, that, you know, uh, for example, if they had, the, if there was water coming in or like, you know, weather, weather conditions that you know got inside the house this, then is, you... this is a great segue for me do you mind guys i'm just going to share a screen with you okay. so we went to um we, we usually don't deal with anything that's resembling akia where i kind of automatically refer these sort of uh things to matt but if somebody mm-hmm. contacts us and says look what well, we've already got a listing in mind it's being advertised for sale by an agent or by a responsive akia bank so for us, there's no investigation required like Matt does. We can just jump right in there and start communicating in regards to the sale. So we might do it. So we went to Yamaguchi to look at this. Um, am I allowed to share a screen, Tracy? I think you should. I just allowed you. And I have a question. So yeah. while I could get a word in each one, I've got a question. Yeah, no, I'll go for it. I'll look for the uh, look for the photos. Uh, no, my question is, is like, if you are, what are the, like, if you are not allowed to rebuild because maybe street access or whatever, what are the rules in terms of how much you re- like you have to keep the minimum? What is the minimum viable like foundations that you have to keep before it like to still count as a renovation? Is there a percentage or like you have to have a beam or what is it? I I, I have no idea. I I don't I don't know exactly. To be honest, I'm not going to lie to you. I think I've heard it's a beam. Yeah, I've, I've seen a house that burnt down and they they had a beam and they had to keep the beam inside, but that was it. But, but I am not sure if that's true. Yeah, if it's like a what portion, I don't know what percentage of the actual house. I would have to ask uh, my Japanese, uh, you know, manager, the head, because he knows all the kanji yeah, the, the I have. Of course, I haven't studied that in Japan, so everywhere is different, but he, he's done that, so he knows the rules really well. So when it comes to this, I always refer to him, Yamamoto, and him. I always, or I bring Yamamoto with me, so then he can look at it, and he knows exactly, listen, this is not allowed, because he also understands the rules of different areas and different buildings, so I cannot tell you that I would just, you know, is he the guy that I met the other day? Because I went yes. and visited Blanker's, okay. yes. I went and visited Blanker's new showroom. And um, if you're anywhere near Chiba, drop in and say hello. It's it's lovely. It's really coming along beautifully. It's- yeah, really nice. It was one of the things that we've built because we also wanted to show clients what we can do in terms of commercial real estate. So we rented a skeleton, nothing in there, and we built it from zero to hundred in a month. 28 days. Wow. 28 days done the whole showroom. Beautiful. I think it worked out really well. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, it's, yeah. 
I saw the photos. It looks great. Yeah, 180 square meters. It's great. We are really proud of it. And we still we are still getting few few um, things, a uh, few of the products on display because you know Japan is right now in a state of chaos. So some of them are really late. So like we are getting new ones. We just got a new small bathroom for a display, like a bathroom uh, toilet corner from Toto for display and stuff. So we are still adding little things there than what you've seen. Uh, but yeah, it's really nice. So if you guys are around, pop pop in. Let me know ahead because I'm not there twenty four seven. So if you if you want a personal tour from me, you gotta you know let me know. So I'm there. Well, you I was going to come Friday life, nine huh? p.m. Sorry. <laughs> you mean you have a life? You do something else except sitting in the uh, showroom? Wow. Oh yes, she's a rock star. I, I was doing this from my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> so so Zip shares <laughs> like me. <laughs> Share the screen. Go, go, yeah. go, go. So, so this one's a house in Yamaguchi. It's a beautiful old house. I'll show you the uh, pictures of the parts of it that are um, more interesting, uh, livable. I wouldn't call them livable, but um, the entire back of the house. So you walk through the house. It's your typical older Japanese home. It's been um, not lived in for the last two decades or so. And it's gorgeous. Most of it is pretty well intact. And there's a beautiful artwork, um, like, you know, antiques and... Uh, beautiful shojis and a gorgeous house. But then you get to the back, you open the door um, and the entire back section of the house looks like this. Okay, let's look at that. Oh my God. <laughs> right? Oh my God. <laughs> so apparently there was a water, you, you were mentioning that just now, there was a, um, a roof water leak started yeah. about 20 years ago. Nobody was living there, nobody touched it and eventually it all caved down, right? Yeah. So the rest of the house has got, it's huge. It's got about eight or nine um, rooms in it. And this section must have had, we don't, we don't have the original floor plan, but it must have had at least three or four rooms in it as well. Um, what would you do with some, I mean, obviously you would remove everything yeah. and, and, and dispose of it, but what would you need to watch out for when you're cleaning up this kind of area to make sure that you're not damaging the rest of the house? Well, well first you would remove the rumble that it's there, uh, you would start from the middle, then the closer you go to the house, you would definitely not be really able to use any heavy machinery because that can that can definitely damage. The okay, so that's when you see all of these uh, burly Japanese men just physically removing bits and pieces, right? Yeah, you would go, you would definitely go for the most part, you would go with hands and with, uh, you know, definitely nothing that vibrates or anything, just to remove it and get to the part of the house that that are still standing. Yep. And that's when you would bring in an inspector to check the walls and stuff, because some of the beams, they look pretty strong. Yep. Well, just so just... just just so people who are on the podcast and not actually on the video listening, the, the, the photo Ziv has just put up is basically of, you know, I think like you, we're just looking at it. It looks like a demolished house where you see the sky and the roof has completely collapsed and it's just rubble on the ground, rubble on the ground floor and no roof at all. The whole roof is completely gone. Not but even it's a, a bit of roof, roof structure. Of structure, right? It's not, a, it, it's just a part of the structure, <clears throat> not the yes. whole structure. Yes, that's correct. So I'll, I'll quickly browse through the rest of it so you see what the rest of it looks like. Um, let me let me know if you can see that. Give me a sec. Yeah, I, I can see your screen. Yeah. Can you see more, the other photos? Rubble. Am I cycling through for you as well? Yes, yeah, you are. You're cycling through, yeah. Okay, so this is the uh, destroyed the, the section, but then we get back into the house. Yeah, yeah. The rest of it is is in pretty good shape. I mean, there are a few sections where the ceiling might need a bit of work. There are a few sections where you want to replace um, some is flooring. It open? Sorry? Is it Ryokan? Um, it looks like it might have been, but um, according to the owner, no. They've just lived in it themselves and they stopped living there 20 years ago. So, so it was a it's family. not get to the yeah. living. So see, the living room is actually in really, really good shape. They are still, yeah, yeah. it's intact. It is intact yeah. and they've left everything there. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's 20, 30 like, years so, old, everything, but so, yeah. So that, that hasn't been used for 20 years? Correct. Yeah, I mean, I, I know, so by different opinion but like i look at that and i go i've like not that whole thing has got to come down especially 
when you have such a substantial part of section to rebuild as well, it's like you're going to have a, a brand new section and another part that's really, and I, yeah, it's like old and it looks like that's a no insulation. Well, I guess it depends on your depends goal. what you would and, use yeah. it for. It depends what you would use exactly. it for because yeah. the property is yeah. really big. The property huge. is mm. huge. I would not think you might have to take it all down, but it's difficult to assess anything from pictures because yeah. part of it looked really nice. It, and what would you... It's huge. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, that's not, not just the house itself. Mm -hmm. The land around it is huge again. I'm looking at that, yeah. yeah. What's the, the price there? What, what, so what, what was the price they're looking at at this, this property, just so we know? Three million like, what, what, Yeah, so, and, and here's, here's the thing. So three million yen. So you're going to spend a lot more than that on the re... On just, just like the tidy... Uh, almost like one, one to two million yen on the tidy up of that destroyed of area. Of course, right. but I mean, just the land itself in this area, even if you factor in the six or seven yeah. million yen that it takes to remove all the crap, um, just the land itself, and it's a beautiful location in a nice neighborhood. We're not talking about some major yeah. Inaka, right? Um, yeah. That That's worth it right there, right? I mean, yeah. not worth it in the sense that it can necessarily go up or you might resell it at a profit, but I mean, as is to do whatever you want with it in the future, it's not a bad piece of land to have for three million yen. I think the key the key there would be what they want to use it for. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, personal a, personal holiday home purposes with perhaps in the future if the person is actually living here perhaps renting out parts of the house as Airbnb. You know, when it's Airbnb, I think in in a car like that or in like, you know, in those areas maybe people might be more inclined or, you know, wanting to rent uh, an old Japanese, traditional Japanese house. Yep. So yeah. I I would still, I would still look at that. I would still want to salvage part of it because it looks beautiful. And if you mm. want to, if you want to rent it out, uh, then I would still look if it can be salvaged or not. But I mean, that's because me, I'm a sucker for, for the traditional Japanese houses. I'm still thinking how I'm going to get one of those for myself. You're absolutely right. And the, the agent that's listing it is actually, she specializes in that. She wants to save these old cars, So she would never, she would never facilitate a sell to somebody who wants to completely demolish it. Yeah. Oh. Um, so that's another section of it that we think needs a bit of work is the ceiling over here. Yeah. That's and then, um, but the... Um, so this is a tiny little rental. So it's, it's got another little house that was used previously for rentals, just like a granny flat on the premises as well. Um, also, I mean, pretty old, but standing. And then just took some pictures all around the house. So I think the entire space that it's sitting on is close to a thousand square meters. And then the house itself is about 250, 300 meters. Yeah. Mm. I would buy it for the land alone and then decide, you know. <laughs> what can be salvaged, right? Yeah, that's, but that's just me because, as I said, I'm, I'm madly in love with the traditional Japanese homes and I'm always trying to, I'm really trying to figure out how I'm going to get one of similar properties for myself as, like, you know, my little playground. Uh, no, I agree. There's, and there are a lot of people who are into that. It's not, um, it's not unusual to see people who are looking for exactly these kinds of properties. Yeah, but when you come to the property, then, uh, then you, you know, there's so many factors that you, you have to look at. And maybe, maybe if you bring experts there, they will tell you it's not doable. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's not doable. Maybe it is. So then it depends if, because from the picture, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Of course. But, but what does inspection? So we've done some inspections on much smaller houses, like your typical 3DK, 3LDK was usually... Not including the roof was usually somewhere between a thousand to two thousand US for the structural inspection. Mm. Um, what would an inspection on a place this size cost? Do you think? No idea. Okay, but it could no, go up to say a million or close to it, right? Uh, yeah. Million yen, I mean, yeah. For the inspection alone. Yeah. 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 Oh really? Wow. I so I, I, I don't know. I also I think you know depending on the area, people charge differently. Tokyo experience. Yeah, it is a bit different. That's right. Yeah. Friend money. Then inspector and then Yamaguchi inspector so I don't think they have uh, you know 
I don't think they have a specific amount. So uh, we've done a few in um, not super big metropolitan centers, but um, reasonably sized cities like say Kyoto, Nara, um, maybe even Kobe. They were usually about jugo man yen for a typical three LDK house, so about fifteen hundred US for a house, not including the roof. Yeah. The roof's a whole different estimate. Yes, so because, when... and over here you would have to definitely do the roof because different parts of the roof. I don't. I have no idea, but I, I would say at least a mil. Yeah. Wow. So just for inspection, yeah, I guess that's like the size of this house, and I think the condition of this house. It requires a lot more detail and I've got no experience with that at all. But what I do have experience with are just typical houses in Tokyo. So, you know, two or three story houses, say a hundred, anyway, 80 to 120 square meters, sort of standard, well, what we're used to in Tokyo, at least anyway, for a standalone house. Um, inspections cost, say, anywhere from 80,000 to 120,000 yen. Yep. Okay. Um, and what the person does is they come in and so, sorry? Doesn't include the roof, right? Uh, no, no, it'll include the roof as well, but it's like- The roof actually the roof. going up Generally, to the roof or looking at it from the ground floor kind of thing? Uh, they kind of look, look at it from like the, depends on the second or third floor, depends on how they can have access to it. Yeah. But they, they, so they often like, they won't go and do a thorough inspection of every kind of flat and every tile. And look, the houses I'm talking about, let's say they are about 20 years old, mm -hmm. okay, 20, 25 years old. Um, generally, generally, the property is under 10. So how it works in Tokyo, like in Tokyo for the most part, is you, it's not so common for people actually in Japan, to, in Tokyo, to get housing inspections done officially as part of the contract or purchase application. It's really uncommon, which is strange for Westerners because it's basically standard policy that we do it. We make it um, almost everything is subject to, to uh, the inspection. The inspection, yeah, yeah. Okay, whereas in Japan, it's not. And if someone makes an offer, so for example, if I've got a client that wants to make an offer, it's a property that they want and they really want it quickly. And, and if it's a hot property, um, then if we apply at the full asking price, generally we, we say we do not want an inspection. Because if we apply and say we do want an inspection, an inspection, the seller's agent will actually prioritize someone who does not want an inspection because it's an extra level and it's an extra hurdle, right? And usually, you can kind of like tell to a degree if you if we go to a house that's six, seven years old, right, and it looks really, really tidy. Um, well, you still the have the owner's warranty, uh, the uh, builder's warranty at that stage. Yeah, right? yeah, um, you you do, but even then, you can kind of tell. Look, it doesn't need it. Um, yeah. But there are some properties that are a bit older. That are, you know what? Let's we're a bit curious about it. And generally, it's wooden houses because there are things like termites that you can't see. Um, when they come and do the inspection, they'll check under the ground, un under the house. They'll check the floor level. So they actually have like a laser laser measure, all right. And it checks the, like how many millimeters um, off each corner of every room is. And then there are like little access ports. Like the, the whole the houses in Tokyo are quite small so they don't have massive amounts of room to check in between the walls and in the ceilings but they can stick their head up through the the manhole cover and 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 sort of have a have a look um you know and send some cameras through under the house as well um the ones that have the concrete base it's almost like a maze when they go to the access point in one of the closets or whatnot yeah they can go underneath and check everywhere and they can see if there's any mold or what have you or termites and so gaps that, between the actual um, floor of the house to the support beams at, at the bottom. I've sure, seen, but yeah. precisely, yeah. Like, check if the conditions are, are all right in general. And that costs, you know, again, 80 to 100 to 120,000 yen, right? Um, and it takes maybe four hours to do. So it's a significant, you know, time that they spend on it. And they give you a very detailed report with lots of photos, um, lots of information. And in fact, when we do it, they don't let the agent speak to the inspection company. The, the inspection company will only speak directly with the buyer who's paying them. Um, yep. And they say, if it's, buy, if it's buyer paid, we'll only speak with them because they want to make sure that the agent or third party doesn't whitewash some of the information to try to get the sale. 
So often there are two types of inspections, the buyer inspection or the seller side inspection. Um, and if you, as a buyer, are, like if, if I go to the client, we're looking at a house and it's a little bit older, a little bit more run down, needs some renovation work. And we can see signs of mold, et cetera. And we really think there's going to be some concern about the structure of it. Then we'll generally insist on a, um, on a uh, inspection. And sometimes those properties, the seller will actually have an inspection report available. The buyer can say, look, that's sufficient for me. There's enough photos, enough information here. But it, often it's actually still worthwhile if they are concerned about the property for the buyer to pay themselves to do it. And the buyer side one, you know you're going to get more information um, because you're paying yeah. for it. The seller may have not disclosed any kind of, anything that's not that they're not legally obliged to do i think they're not right. that common in the um in the areas and the types of properties that you deal with too emil because um like in tokyo especially there's going to be a buyer down the track very quickly who's not going to care about an inspection um, but if you're looking at the vacant property i'm not talking about anything as dilapidated as that one but if you're looking at a vacant property that's been standing vacant for a good few years in an area that's maybe not super popular and the listing's been up there for a while. If it's super cheap, then yes, the seller will say, look, forget about inspections. What you see is what you get. And you know, that's the price. But um, if it is, you know, reasonably priced and it costs, you know, a fair few bucks, then yes, they will, they will definitely go for an inspection and the seller will allow it. But I think um, some of us need to wrap up pretty soon, definitely myself included as well. So um, Sure, I mean, I had a question for next week, so I wanna put a pin in it. Yeah. Um, what I wanna know is, and maybe we could all do some research on this, is what is the minimum size house that you can build that doesn't need inspection? So I'm talking tiny house, or I saw someone online well, has, actually, has actually ordered a kit home from China, from Alibaba, and it's being delivered. What are the what are the rules about that? This is something that's well, interesting. And if you do electricity and you're gonna hook it to uh, like all like, and stuff, then you need permission. Yeah, but like size wise, so we can talk about. We that need to clarify. Way. Yeah, yeah, and just, just yeah, need to clarify. We talk about inspection. What we were talking about just now is just a property inspection to take the condition of a house by an ind independent third party. Whereas I think what Trace, what you're talking about is permits for construction uh, with the, with city hall. Tracy, that's different. Yeah. That's different, Tracy. Yeah, that's yeah. a different. No, that's a different. I was going to change yeah. the topic completely. So that's what I was sure, going to okay. segue into that. But Sorry, we, Tracy. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to uh, leave you out of there. That's okay. Oh, we're, oh, you just put a pin in it for next week. Um, and because I saw something online that someone's, like I said, they've bought a kit home from China and it's on its way. And I was just really curious to see what everyone thought about that. About That is a good topic for next week, actually. Kit if homes, you, log houses, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, very build interesting. your own tiny houses. If it's on it, like, I think if it's on a trailer, then it's not even counted. But yeah, that would be really good. Yeah. So, all right. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for your time. See you soon. Thank you. Welcome back, Emil. Bye. 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 Be back. Bye. So there you have it. Real edgy session today. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any interest at all in these topics, I'm sure you did. And as always, don't be shy to let us know what other topics you'd like us to discuss in our next sessions. We've been getting more and more feedback, comments, and requests for content, all of which make us really happy. So keep them coming, and we'll do our best to touch upon anything which piques your interest in future episodes as well. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company, and you've got any sort of business or visa-related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. 
do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think so leave us a short rating or review on the itunes store on spotify or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode we love hearing from you hope to have you with us again next time and until then have a great day